I don't know what that recording is going to look like afterwards. Anyway, the notes on here are talking about what the standard states are. So right away, the state for note two, if I look at note two, it's telling you here's the standard state for a gas. It's a pure ideal gas, one bar 25C. Not a problem. We can handle ideal gases without too much trouble. Liquids are similar. They're just pure things at one bar and 25 degrees C. Again, we can handle that okay. The ones where you can get into trouble are when you have solutes in aqueous solutions, because here the reference state, the standard state, is an ideal one molal solution of solute dissolved in water at one bar and 25 degrees Celsius. Excellent reason for that, which is if you're in bio, that's a pretty common state that you might encounter. You'll, like we said yesterday, you don't just come across like lumps of DNA or something like that. Um, anybody know what a molal is compared to a molar solution? They're different. Yeah, it's just moles per kilogram, right? Molar is moles per liter. Uh, molal is moles per kilogram. So there's a slight difference in there. And it can have an effect because you're dealing with like PPM, PPB, PPT levels of things. At any rate, if you see the aqueous on there, that messes up the next start, step that we're doing with the fugacities. So you just have to be very careful um, if you're dealing with things in aqueous systems. Uh, the other part, the note one there is the same note um, that we've seen before. So we're not going to worry about that. Um, let's go back to our uh, ammonia example. If we needed to fa figure out what K is for ammonia or for the ammonia synthesis reaction, we would go to a table like this and look up all those H's and G's. Um, they're not actually listed on this particular table. I'm just going to list them for you. If we wanted to know delta G, oh, that's red. Delta G ref circle. Remember, that's the sum of the stoichiometric coefficients times delta G formation I. Circles. Sometimes different thermal books will not include the circles on the um, Gibbs energy of formation. That's OK. Uh, so if we just go from left to right, the coefficient on nitrogen was minus 1. Anybody remember what the Gibbs free energy of nitrogen is for formation? Zero. zero. Elements are almost always zero. Uh, plus, we burn through three moles of hydrogen, which is going to get another zero. Uh, and then plus, we develop two moles of ammonia. And I had looked that one up, and its Gibbs energy of formation was minus 16.4 kilojoules per mole. Do all of that math, and you're left with minus 32.8 kilojoules per mole. Notice right away, if you change the stoichiometry of the problem, you change your Gibbs energy of uh, reaction for this. That is not a problem as long as you keep track of that stoichiometry through the entire problem. Any extensive quantity that you end up calculating, like mass or moles or something like that, that cannot be um, affected by the stoichiometry that you choose for that reaction. Intermediate steps, intensive values can change depending on your stoichiometry. This is one that could change. If I double all the stoichiometric coefficients, I double that. Um, but that's, that's OK. If you did the enthalpy of reaction, delta H ref circle, same idea. I'm not going to write every one of these out. Delta G, f oh, yeah, use the delta G again. Delta H, formation I. I would do exactly what I did in that previous step, except instead of delta G's here, I go look up the delta H's. Um, and if I look up that, uh, all those numbers and do the math, I get minus 92 kilojoules per mole. There's not really any shortcuts you can take there. You just have to, to tabulate them. I always mess up the signs if I don't do the parentheses thing. So you'll almost always see me do the parentheses thing. Um, and then we dump those into our uh, expressions for K0 and K1. So K0 was exponential minus delta G ref circle over RT ref. So that means I'm putting this number inside here. T ref is the one that was used at whichever temperature you got your Gibbs energies of formation. So that's 298.15K. R is whatever you want it to be as long as the units cancel. 
The, you can never take the exponent of a number with units, so the units up there have to cancel. 8.314 is the one that comes up most often, um, which also means you need to watch the kilojoules versus the joules. Uh, if you work those numbers through, you'll end up with 5.58 uh, times 10 to the fifth. One of the tricky things with k, whenever you're doing a k calculation, the order of magnitude there can be very uh, I don't want to say irrelevant, you obviously need it. There's no way to estimate, like, ballpark, yeah, that k naught's real because it's on the order of 10 to the 5th. You can easily get up into, like, 10 to the 30th or 10 to the 40th. If you try it for, like, a combustion reaction, one of the reasons those combustion reactions are so great is because they all go to products, right? You will burn up every bit of that fuel, which means these k values tend to be enormous. So the, there's really no... Um, rule of thumb that you can use to estimate the magnitude of something like that. You just have to calculate it and do it carefully so that you don't make any mistakes. K1 is the exponential. And I guess just for, to, to mix things up for K1, because I write things all the time, we'll actually plug in the numbers for this one. Um, so we have the plain old delta H, which is minus 92. We have to multiply that by 1,000 because that's in kilojoules per mole, and the R that I'm about to write, which is 8.314, is joules. Multiply that by T ref, 298.15. Then multiply all of this by 1 minus T ref, 298.15, uh, divided by the actual temperature that you're um, operating at. I don't think I gave you a temperature for this one. Um, it was on that previous screen. But let's just say we want to calculate this one at 700 Kelvin. Um, the actual reaction occurs at 700 Kelvin, so we would put 700 Kelvin in here. Or whatever the temperature is that your reactor is occurring at, or whatever the temperature is where you are in the reactor, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Close the parenthesis over here, um, and you will end up with 5.58, that was a coincidence, I didn't set out to do that, times 10 to the minus 10. There is no reason whatsoever that those two numbers have to be the same in digits and different powers, entirely coincidental from the way that I did this um, problem. So if we want the, the shortcut, then we just multiply these two together. I take this one as K1, and I multiply it, or sorry, K0, multiply it by um, K1. The end result, then, is k shortcut uh, is equal to 3.1 times 10 to the minus 4. Right? And that's what we would say is k approximately k because it's equal to k naught times k1. And that can be enough, right? If you're doing something by hand, or as we'll see in a minute, if that's the only thing that you can do, the, the shortcut is good enough. If we wanted to use the full Van Hoff equation, so the full, I love saying Van Hoff, so I always write it off, write it down. The full Van Hoff equation is saying, let k actually be equal to k0, k1, k2. That's the one where we have to do something else. Um, so this one always goes to the k calc spreadsheet. Um, the KCALC spreadsheet, I'll, I'll take a minute right now and show you how to use that one. Um, you can use KCALC within, actually, I am going to have to stop the recording here because you can't see this. Okay, now that we are done with um, the KCALC spreadsheet, let's look at, as I said at the beginning of the lecture, we're going to spend our time working on this part over here the pi and the fugacities and all that. We derived that yesterday um, when we were uh, starting off with just our Gibbs energy, uh, and we had eventually worked out that like sum of stoichiometric coefficients times um, chemical potentials, the mu's. We eventually worked all the way through to get to this, um, and now we have to take care of those uh, fugacities. We only have about two cases for fugacities, uh, so fortunately these go pretty quickly. When we are dealing with Oops, not green. The term pi is, sorry, pi fi hat over fi circle raised to the stoichiometric coefficients. The one on the top 
Fi circle is talking about the species in solution. So in some kind of a mixture, right? Anytime we have a reactor going on, we de by definition have to have a mixture because otherwise your reactor is not making anything. It's just sitting there with pure species. The denominator down here is the species in standard state. How do you know what the standard state is? Use the same standard state that was used when you looked up your Gibbs energy of formation and your enthalpy of formation. They vary. Uh, it depends on what you're after. Fortunately, we're only interested in about two. So case one uh, is gases. So if we have a gas, every term that sits inside there, the Fi hat over Fi circle looks like this. The easy part is the fugacity in the standard state. Remember, we just actually saw in that table, the standard state for gases is usually the ideal gas at 298 and one bar. Um, as a result, this becomes one bar, the P0. We've seen that P0. Have we seen P0 before? Yeah, I think we've seen P0. Anyway, it's one bar every single time, one bar. Very easy to determine if you've made a mistake on P0. If you wrote anything other than one bar, you made a mistake. Um, that's the only thing that P0 is for an ideal gas, is one bar. The fugacity of the, um, so the, the species in a solution, right, at whatever um, temperature and mixture that we're interested in, uh, you, thermo gets a bad rap sometimes. So yesterday I said Gibbs energy wasn't useful, so we replaced it with chemical potential. And then I said chemical potential wasn't good, so we replaced it with fugacity. And now fugacity is not particularly helpful, so we'll put it in fugacity coefficients instead. I didn't make these rules up, but I can see why that could be frustrating, um, because we just keep replacing things with other things, um, which is not always helpful when you're trying to learn it. Anyway, if you think back to thermo, and we needed the fugacity of something in solution, we could write that as the fugacity coefficient times the partial pressure. So I just spread out the partial pressure right there. If you take a mole fraction times the total pressure, it's the uh, partial pressure. Um, we have to do an approximation there because we don't know what phi is particularly well most of the time. Um, on the other hand, most of the phi's that we will ever deal with are really close to one. Um, so that correction factor because of that phi is not particularly big, whether it's the solution version or the pure species version. If you want to prove that to yourself, that's what that other tab is in kcalc. Dump in the species that you want at whatever temperature and calculate that phi. They're usually around like 0.9, something like that, 0.98, something like that very close to one. So we often ignore it and approximate this as the partial pressure of I divided by P zero, or I should say P circle. When we put this inside our full summation, when we have uh, this expression, uh-oh, we're lagging on my movie. It's not a movie, I'm not watching a movie, I'm recording. When we put that in here, remember these are all raised to their stoichiometric coefficients, what we end up with is the following. We have, we're gonna just deliberately split this into two different pieces um, because we normally label these things. Uh, we have one that looks like the sum of all the partial pressures, or sorry, the product of all the partial pressures raised to their stoichiometric coefficients times the product of all of the standard pressures raised to the minus stoichiometric coefficient. That looks weird because we have a superscript circle followed by a superscript nu. Um, that's okay though. This particular term always takes on a particular value. What is that value? It always has a numerical value of one. What are the units? Something bar, right? It's something bar raised to the stoichiometric coefficient, whatever that sum is. So it's bar raised to the sum of minus stoichiometric coefficient. So it's got a weird unit of bar. As long as you carry bar everywhere, who cares what that unit is? It's gonna be perfectly canceled by the partial pressure. As long as the partial pressure units are in bar, those units will end up working out just fine. So always use bar. As soon as you see a pressure, if it's anything other than bar, convert it to bar. This particular term has a special name. We can't simplify that at all. That's generally where we stop. 
but we call this K sub P. Please turn off your cell phones. Embarrassing, embarrassing. That, my cell phone, right? Um, we call that K sub P. That is what now the fifth, K, no, sixth K that we've got. We've got K, K0, K1, K2, KSC, and KP. KP is the one that has partial pressures. We try to label those somewhat intuitively, so when you see K subscript P, it means it's the, the product of all the, pressure, the partial pressures. Yeah? Where did the, oh, um, I replaced YI times P with PI. So the partial pressure of any species is the mole fraction times the total pressure. And that's as far as we take gases. Um, you can go further if you want to work on that fugacity coefficient, the phi that's in there, uh, but we generally don't. Um, you can use that other page in the K-Calc if you so desire. So the, at the end of the day, what you're left with essentially is all of that is equal to Kp. Right? I've omitted this other one. Sometimes you will find that one labeled as Kp0. Sorry, Kp circle. That's fine. You can label that if you want. But it always has the numerical value of 1. Um, so we don't often, excuse me, carry that around. Uh, it's just not particularly relevant as long as you remember bar. So if we're interested in um, gases, the product of all those fugacities just looks like the K sub P, which is the product of all of the partial pressures raised to their stoichiometric coefficients. Um, one more for liquids, and then we're going to see uh, an example of this. Case two is liquids. Uh, liquids actually end up looking somewhat uh, similar. There's just a, mm, I don't know, a little bit of a hand-waving argument that looks inside here. We have to start at the same place, which is every time we need to evaluate the fugacity of any species in solution compared to its standard state. The fugacities in um, solution usually look like your activity coefficients, gammas, times a mole fraction times the fugacity of the pure species. So it's not necessarily the pure species at the standard state. There's no circle on that. Uh, so it's at whatever you know, temperature and pressure you're interested in. But it's no longer in solution. It's for a pure species. Uh, and all of that over Fi circle. The hand-waving trick that we get away with here whenever we're dealing with um, basically anything in classical chemical engineering is that this ratio the fugacity of the pure species at whatever temperature and pressure you're inter interested in versus the fugacities of that same pure species at the standard state is really close to one. Those two references, we can calculate what those are. They, they just tend not to be particularly large. Uh, and so we're just left with an activity coefficient times xi. Nothing wrong with something like that, uh, except uh, you, if you recall back to 102, there's no simple form for that gamma I. Um, every time you want to use a gamma I, if you have a, a liquid mixture, a liquid reaction, you have to iterate on the solution. There's, there's no useful closed forms of gamma I. Um, and so like any good engineer, we're going to approximate gamma I as 1. And just say all of our solutions are ideal. That is. Okay, sometimes. Um, the problem is there's not, uh, the thing that liquids have going for them is liquids are typically pretty cold um, relative to the temperatures of gases. Gases in a reactor go up to, you know, eight, 900 Kelvin or something like that. And those deviate quite a bit from ideality. Most of the time, whenever you have something in a liquid, it's fairly cool. And those gamma coefficients aren't particularly big, at least due to the temperature. They can be very, very large because of the interactions with other molecules. That's where gamma becomes a problem. It's not so much the temperature dependence, it's the interaction with the other molecules. That's what can make gamma very large. So if you're trying to remember or try to figure out whether or not gamma is big or not, kind of have to ballpark it and say, do I think these two molecules behave similarly? Do they interact similarly? Are they structured similarly? Are they both long chain hydrocarbons that only differ by like one hydrogen? Um, at any rate, we're not going to iterate through any of those, so you'll always see um, gamma i as approximately 1. 
As a result, the product that we have, the product of Fi, the fugacity of pure species, or sorry, fugacity of species I in solution versus the standard state raised to the stoichiometric coefficient um, is always going to look like the mole fraction in the liquid phase raised to its stoichiometric coefficient. And we call that, we have another name for that one as well, uh, which is K sub X. All right, the X is trying to tell you, take that product of all of the X's raised to their stoichiometric coefficients and you have KX. If you were to have included the gamma here, the gamma would have resulted in another K called K gamma, but we don't use K gamma. That's pure, li that's liquids as in liquids that chemical engineers often encounter. If you have a, a, a system that is aqueous, which is slightly, subtly different, right? You're interested in something that is in a liquid, but may or may not itself be considered a liquid. You have to use a different case for aqueous solutions, which is why you're not going to see any aqueous solutions um, because it requires, I, I think at that point we would clear like a dozen different Ks on here. This is fine. All of them work just like this. You just have different expressions for the fugacity ratios. Um, if you're working in some uh, area that's not um, like classic chemical engineering where these assumptions work, surely some thermobook has tabulated which fugacities you need, um, and you can go dig them up. These two are the relationships that let us go from the purely temperature-dependent K that we calculated Thursday, or Wednesday, today's Thursday, to something that actually has something to do with concentration. So any time that we have this for gases, uh, we always have K sub P is equal to K0, K1, K2. And for liquids, uh, we have Kx is equal to K0, K1, K2. You can make any of those assumptions that we've made, right? If I need the shortcut Van Hoff, then it's just KP is equal to K0, K1. If I need the full Van Hoff, then it's something like this. Um, these two values here, the KX and the KP, those typically come from our stoichiometric tables, right? Remember when we wrote a stoichiometric, ta uh, stoichiometric table, we had species, uh, stoichiometric coefficient, species coming in, NI not. Uh, species leaving, or if it's a batch reactor, it's species before and after the reaction. This N sub I is where we get the squiggle, right? Because this is equal to Ni0 plus the stoichiometric coefficient times squiggle. I can always calculate Yi as well. Yi is equal to N sub I divided by the total moles. Right, so usually somewhere underneath this, after we fill in all of those values, we have the total moles are equal to the sum of all the moles. And so if we need to know the partial pressures, P sub I, those are equal to Yi times P. This is my equation. This is how I decide whether or not, or, well, this is how I evaluate the impact of that K on the composition of the reactor. So over here, I've got the PIs, which are based on a material balance. Those, once I've got all of those, will become a KP. Let me move the KP over here. So if it's our classic reaction of A plus B goes to C plus uh, D, that would be the partial pressure of C raised to C, partial pressure of D raised to D, partial pressure of A raised to little a, and partial pressure of B raised to B. Right? How do I get that particular information? It's coming from my stoichiometric table, and then I'm making this equal to this. So I can go into um, Kcalc or something like that, or if I have the shortcut information, um, I can get it from here, or from the Gibbs energies of formation and enthalpies of formation, and that'll tell me everything that I need. So this expression 
It's necessarily a function of squiggle, right? Because every time I get the P, I need the I, and, or every time I get P, I need YI, and YI needs N, and N needs squiggle. So that is a function of squiggle. It's also a function of pressure. Why is it a function of pressure? Because pressure shows up right here. It's technically a function of temperature. It's only a function of temperature in, if you include those phi terms. So we usually don't see temperature on that particular side. Um, this is the primary temperature dependence that we're interested in. This is a function of temperature. And that's the link that we needed. We needed a function of temperature to a function of composition, basically, and P. And that's how we get that in this particular case. That doesn't change at all if you want to do liquids. The only element at all that changes if you want to do liquids is instead of yi here, uh, red's a little bit hard, we would instead do xi is equal to ni over nt. We'll see another version of x. There's another way that you can get x later. Um, the other version that you're going to see, we might as well say it now, is a concentration i over a total concentration. That's not going to show up anywhere on this homework. I'm saying that because we're going to come back to it next week. Um, so we'll see it again. But if you're doing a liquid, you at least have one less column, right? I don't need a partial pressure for a liquid phase. Um, I can just stop with the xi's and plug them back up into that expression. So this is how we link um, those particular things together. Let's see if we have enough time for the example that I had. We can get close. We will set up the example now, because I've still got four minutes. We'll finish it tomorrow, and then tomorrow I'll have another example for you to work through. Um, you can earn bonus credit for your exam if you come in tomorrow's lecture. I know, like, um, let's look at that same expression, or that same reaction, um, except we're going to look at one mole of uh, nitrogen that comes in and three moles of hydrogen. Coming out will be some amount of hydrogen, some amount of nitrogen, and some ammonia. Same expression as before, so we can still come up with uh, K is... What did I say K was for the last one? Like, oh, I, th I used the full Van Hoff for this one, so it was uh, 0 0.9 times 10 to the minus 4. Uh, that's, I think I had, we had calculated manually the um, shortcut. So how do I do something like the expressions that I need? I can use my stoichiometric table like this. This process looks pretty much the same as long as you're lucky enough to be working in moles. It gets nastier next week when we have to do concentration because those aren't particularly nice. So we've got nitrogen, hydrogen, and ammonia. Don't forget any uh, inerts. If you have inerts, they, those will play a role. I believe we said minus 1, minus 3, and plus 2. Um, according to what's coming in here, we have 1, 3, and 0. And now each term coming out here, we would have n sub, what did I start with, n2? We'll call that one a because I don't want to carry these around, um, is equal to 1 minus the extent of reaction, and b will be equal to 3, yeah, 3 minus 3 times the extent of reaction, uh, and n sub c is just equal to 2 times the extent of reaction. The total uh, looks like the sum of all of those, so I've got 4, uh, and then I've got minus 4 and plus 2 squiggles, so we've got minus 2 squiggle. If I want the y sub i, I'm just going to write a single y sub i here, because they all look pretty much the same. y a, for example, uh, will be 1 minus squiggle divided by the total, which is 4 minus 2 squiggle. Uh, who asked me about temperature effects on equilibrium a minute ago? 
if it favors products or reactants? Somebody said that. We're not going to have time for that today. We'll get to it tomorrow. Anyway, mole fraction will look something like that. And now I go through, I write all those mole fractions, and I plug them into the original expression that I had. So that expression then looks something like the following. We have k is 0 0.9 times 10 to the minus 4 is equal to the partial pressure of ammonia, which is C, raised to the 2 power, divided by the partial pressure of hydrogen, which was A and had a stoichiometric coefficient of 1, and the partial pressure of, e, no, that one was nitrogen. B was hydrogen, and it had an exponent of 3. This simplifies then to the mole fraction of C squared, mole fraction A, mole fraction B cubed, times what? P to the what? Anybody see what that P is? It's the same P everywhere. What is it? Raised to the 2, right? And specifically the negative 2. Each one of these y's is then a function of squiggle. Since each one of those are a function of squiggle, this whole thing is a function of squiggle. It may not be the best function of squiggle. I might not be able to solve it analytically, but the, there's one equation and one unknown. Um, and so I will leave it. Uh, it's those favorite words that everybody has. I will leave it as an exercise for the reader um, to show that squiggle is one of these. It's either 0 0.33 or, hang on just a second, 1.67. I will leave it to you to decide which one. Yeah. Uh, no, it'll be negative 2. Because each of these y's, each of those p's, are yi times p. So I have two p's on top, four p's on bottom. Okay, I will, we will continue this just briefly, and then we'll have more examples on Friday.